Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Lunchtime Discovery Series. My name is Chris Smith. I am your host. I work for the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences in downtown Raleigh. It's good to be back with you for another edition of the Lunchtime Discovery Series. I missed everybody last Wednesday, but uh, I hear you were in great hands with Jay Reynolds and what was what had to be a fantastic presentation about ancient trees with Dr. David Staley. Uh, if you missed that one, you'll probably wanna go back and check it and figure out just where some of the oldest trees in the world actually live. Good stuff to learn there. This week, we have John Gerwin. John is the research curator for ornithology at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. And if you've been participating in any of these lectures for any length of time, or been keeping up with the Office of Environmental Education's programs too, then you know John Gerwin. Uh, John is an expert naturalist, educator, and scientist doing work on birds, well, well just about all over the world. John, it's good to have you here. It's good to be back. <clears throat> Thanks. And uh, to appease Jerry Reynolds, we'll try to do this as swiftly as we can. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead <laughs> Share the screen. It usually takes a, f a few seconds. Oh, actually, that's the wrong one. Here we go. My computer is a little slow. Like me, it's getting a little older. And uh, Chris, let me know. John, that looks seeing. great. That look, look all right. All right. So today's topic is going to be, a, again, about chimney swifts. And let me see if it will go on to the next one. Well, it's taking a minute. It's actually, it seems to be taking just a minute. Um, so we're, um, I've given this presentation uh, several times around the state. There's a lot of interest in the chimney swift. It's a migratory songbird. And I plan to go over its uh, life cycle, natural history. Chris, the old computer here is just a little bit frozen up um i guess we'll have to rely on uh i'm gonna stop you to just the make the bird calls a second ha <laughs> i'm gonna start start over with this and see what happens it's, i'm gonna share it differently and see if it will restart okay sounds good Thanks for being patient with us, everybody. You know we're gonna have a great presentation for you today. Are you seeing it now? I see your title slide. All right. And now I see a photo looking down a chimney. Down, great. <clears throat> so the first, uh, the, the first, occurrence that we have in written written history of a swift using man-made structure was here in 1682 and we like to say that this uh, event forever changed the relationship of the species and people to think that this bird adapted uh, uh, so quickly to uh, a human construct <clears throat> so i put this together with my colleague john connors who used to work at the museum and also we've both been very involved in Wake Audubon Society and Wake Audubon have been promoting a lot of education and conservation efforts for chimney swifts. And I've been fortunate to be able to merge that with some of the work that I do at the museum. And so that's why we, uh, and there's a lot of interaction with chimney swifts and people. So that's why the <clears throat> talk is titled this way. So I'm gonna cover a little bit about just what is a chimney swift evolution their physiological features, adaptations, and then go over the life cycle of this bird, the full life cycle. So breeding through migration and the non-breeding. Just cover some of the highlights that we've learned. Real quick, uh, the swift, if you look at the, the orange arrow here on the lower right, that's pointing to where the swifts come out on the what we would call the tree of life. So uh, this has been done with genetics, like everything else these days, people borrow a lot of DNA sample or, or tissue samples from places like, like our museum. We process a lot of tissue lines on a 
on a yearly basis. And people do these studies to see who's related to whom. So you can see here that the swifts and uh, the uh, hummingbirds come out as each other's nearest relative. And actually, this is something I did in my, my graduate work before we knew what DNA was. Uh, we used protein analysis to, to look at relationships. And I, I came up with the same answer. Um, so it was really satisfying to see when they started doing DNA work and some others came along and redid the redid the work and they basically got the same answer. <clears throat> so looking at Swifts around the world, there are 70 to 80 species. These, these uh, the, the idea of what is a species has changed over time. And so with the advent of using tissues to get genetic data, we've discovered more species are out there than we thought just because things look alike. And a lot of Swifts do look very similar to one another. Different species can be really hard to tell apart, especially in the tropics, but even there's a couple over in, over in uh, Europe that, are, that can be very difficult to tell apart when they're flying around in the sky. So in North America, four species. And here in the East, we have one, which is the chimney swift. So that's what I'll be focusing on. And here's an example of three very different swifts by size. There's the chimney swift in the middle. Below that, the really small one is referred to as a swiftlet from over in Southeast Asia. Um, the upper one is a very, very large uh, swift also from uh, Southeast Asia. It's, uh, yeah, that's a very, that's a nearly robin sized swift. The little swiftlet on the bottom, by the way, that group of birds is responsible for the bird's nest soup that you may have heard about. Uh, you'll see what a chimney swift nest looks like, and it's, uh, it's a lot of sticks and saliva. What the swiftlets do in Southeast Asia is build a nest out of only saliva. And what the locals figured out was that you can collect those nests and boil the saliva down and make a soup out of it. So that's actually something they manage now, where they manage the swift colonies. They, they have areas set aside specifically for the swift nests on these uh, cliff walls. They will collect the first nest and then they let the birds come back and build another nest and finish the breeding. This is what one looks like uh, on the wing. Nice uh, diagram to show this idea that it's a flying cigar. They do look like a cigar with wings, long, narrow, tapered wings. Chimney swifts are built for flight. So we're going to take a closer look at these guys. <clears throat> Again, it's a flying machine and they do most of their activities while they're flying. It's, uh, um, very aerodynamic bird <clears throat> and it's what we call very high aspect ratio a long narrow wing it's it's an efficient flying machine it's not an efficient uh, landing when you have a wing like this you're re it's really good at flying it's not so good at, at landing so uh, again there's another typical view overhead uh, a lot of times people think they're seeing bats when they're flying around um, and and when they're flying so erratically you can you can you understand there's a similarity up close just to get a good look at this wing and i'm going to show you a diagram next of what the wing bones look like so these if you can see my pointer i'm pointing at the primary flight feather of a chimney swift and they would have 10 counting backwards and these 10 all join at the bird's hand or in the finger bones. And then these little, littler ones here, the smaller ones are the secondaries. They join in the birds on a bone. And you can see in the lower left that here's the tail and the tail tip and the wings extend well beyond the tip of the tail. So again, this is a long, narrow, it's an aerodynamically efficient wing for, for, for forward movement. And here's what it looks like inside um, the upper wing bone <clears throat> diagram is a swift and so i have a very short humerus that would be your 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 forearm or, or upper arm rather and then here the forearm the ulna radius is also somewhat truncated compared to a songbird here the typical robin or cardinal uh, wing structure and then you look here at what is the hand bone what we call the carpal bones. And you can see that it's, it's much, much longer than your typical songbird. And this is where those primary flight feathers attach here. 
and and so it's a very a very different again a very different wing structure from many other birds and this is very similar to hummingbirds so again think of it as the ham bones which it, so these are um a couple of finger bones here the fingers of birds are they don't have four they're fused and then a thumb bone <clears throat> It's a strong wing, but it's a very rigid wing. Looking at their feet up close, uh, they have typical looking bird's foot, but you can, what's not so typical is how short the tarsus is here. And the Swifts belong to a family that's called apodity. So A means without and you probably know pod from podiatry that's referring to feet so without feet uh these birds when they were first you know seen and and first uh collected they were thought to not have any feet or just were so short that it seemed like they didn't have any feet and here's the tip of the tail and a lot of swifts have uh, um your points the the what we would call a true swift, not that swiftlet, but like that large swift you saw in the earlier photo. And then birds in the genus Kaitura, which this is the scientific name of the chimney swift is Kaitura pelagica. And they, uh, the Kaitura means spine tailed. So here are the, here's, again, the spines on the tip of the tail. This certainly helps them when they're perched inside of a vertical server. They, these birds do not perch horizontally. If they were to land on the ground, for example, they can't they can't lift off. They can't get off the ground. They're, they're stuck, and they can't land on a horizontal, horizontally on a branch, for example. They can only perch vertically, which is where they nest and roost. So, what do they do when they're flying? Well, pretty much everything. I mean, we make jokes about, it, but it's really, really, they do all the stuff. They feed. They do. They court. They, they take. They're known now to take naps uh, on the wing. They snap nest twigs off trees. And, and then they fly into the chimney to build a nest, but all this activity that they're doing is on the wing. So I'm gonna start with the nesting season and then we'll go through the, the cycle. Um, where they breed, the chimney swift is east of the Rocky Mountains so and um, so in the Great Plains on east. And this is just showing some data from surveys that are been done you can see they're more common the higher density is here in this part of the southeast and a little bit of the midwest so again uh i mentioned this early on and early but 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 very early on about this time chimney swifts would have been a tree swift or a tree swallow they were called they would have been nesting in big hollow trees and then they slowly adapted to nesting in chimneys. Um, here's an early, early photo from Mark Catesby, uh, who drew what he called the American Swift, or he called it the chimney swallow, and it was nesting in a brick well. So pretty interesting that soon after the bird was found in the cabin in Maine in around 1682, Catesby comes along and finds one in a brick well. So Apparently, the, the, the information spread from one swift to another to start using these different structures where they could. So here's, um, again, it's what I mean that they uh, used to be called a hollow tree swift long ago before they adopted chimneys. Uh, just to show you the uh, range map. So again, here it is in the Eastern US. Here's their migration and this is their non-breeding range. And I just point out that really the most data that we have is, is along the coast of Peru and then the north and the Western Amazon basin. We actually don't have a lot of data. We, we presume that they are all throughout this purple, purplish uh, part of Northwest South America, but we're still not really sure because when the chimney swift gets down here, it looks a lot like several other species of Kaitura and they can be hard to tell apart. The local ornithologists have been figuring out how to tell them apart little by little the past decade, but it's a tricky, it's been a tricky proposition. So here's a nest up, uh, some examples of the nest up close. 
So what they do after they grab these uh, sticks, dead twigs off of a tree, the female flies into the chimney that she's selected and begins to glue them to the to the wall here. And it's making she's making a semicircle. So she'll start uh, lay down some of the saliva here and then attaching the twigs on either side and then building out toward the middle. So it's, you can see it's not a very, it doesn't look like a very strong, strong structure. In fact, uh, during some strong weather events, rain, if a lot of water gets into a given chimney, we've seen where they get washed away and she'll, she'll rebuild. Um, and so although the chimney swift is a pretty social animal and they don't really, they're not really territorial out in the sky. They're doing all their foraging on the wing and flying around. They are territorial when it comes to, to breeding. There's just one nest per chimney. So again, the female will, will use her saliva, her salivary glands enlarge quite a bit in May after they return from the, from the wintering grounds. And uh, then they use the saliva to glue these twigs together. Now here's a couple of shots I took. We have this chimney that we built out at a, a prairie ridge and, and I'll mention that at the end, but um, the birds have been nesting in it for the last five years. So from underneath with the light shining through, you can see it's a pretty loose structure, although it's, again, it's held together, kind of like pickup sticks glued together. And you can see there's four eggs here with the light. And then here's with the flash, it, it, uh, just to give you an idea of how the structure looks without the sunlight streaming through, you can see the one of the eggs here. So there's where one has just gotten started on the left. So this was in an artificial wooden uh, chimney and uh, some folks in Texas got some good photos. The four to five eggs is their normal clutch. They can lay six or seven, but four to five eggs is typical. And they will incubate for about three weeks. <clears throat> Again, I mentioned the saliva. The other thing about the, uh, the egg laying is that she, the female will start to incubate before the clutch is finished. So then the first, the first egg that was laid will be the first one to hatch. And as the brood is aging, as, the, as she's feeding them going along, the, the young will, will develop quite, they develop fairly quickly, but then you'll start, you can see a difference in the ages of these nestlings, even though they might only be two or three days apart. And so one of the, the oldest, the oldest one can, will fledge then a few days earlier than the youngest. So it's staggered. Um, and so I mentioned these earlier, just a reminder that this is, this is our chimney swift in the middle. So here's a, a three babies that were the uh, three. They're, they're still, well, they're not really nestling. They're not really fledgling. They're in between. <laughs> um, this is over Prairie Ridge. So they, uh, they had three eggs that year. It was a couple of years ago. What they do is they leave the nest after they're about two weeks old, but they remain perched nearby for two more. So they don't fledge. What we call the official fledge is when they're capable of sustained flight they do not fledge until they're about a month old. But while they're there for those two weeks outside the nest, they can practice flapping their wings. And that builds up both, there's, there's the wing muscle itself, and then the, those muscles attach over to the breast muscles. And so they're, they're building up their, their strength that way. And, and, it, and it looks to me like this little guy here, you can see a tail is a little shorter, this feather's a little shorter, he's a little smaller, he or she is a little smaller. So, that is um, what I mean about, you can tell the difference in age. This one's two or three days older than this one. So, so they finish nesting, so they take about a month and they'll finish nesting. And that's actually going on about, about now. Usually by the fourth week of July, they are through with raising their young. The young come out, they fledge. And once they come out, they've got to be able to fly and then they they start learning how to forage for themselves they will fly around with the adults and and essentially they've got to get going they will they will be a little heavier than the adults adult birds feed the young and they get them five or ten percent heavier than it than say the normal adult that gets a young bird that gives them a, a few days 
um, buffer while it's learning how to forage, learning how to capture its own food. And, um, but these, um, these families will then begin to coalesce sort of into little neighborhood flocks and they'll start to roost together in small flocks. As August goes along, they will begin to form into bigger flocks. So Audubon made some interesting, uh, interesting observation back in 1808 in Louisville, Kentucky. He was watching this flock. Um, I like how, how he wrote it. Um, <clears throat> and again, he called them swallows. And they were, as he said, pitching into the hole of this, of this hollow branch, like bees hurrying into their hive. It turns out this was a sycamore tree that was pretty big. And it had uh, a branch had fallen off or broken off and left this big hole in the side of it. So these birds were going into the side of the tree, not down the top, like on, a, like on our chimney, but in the side, like he said, like bees going into their hive. He later went in, he, he got a, help, a helper in town. He went back at night and they cut a hole in the base of this tree. And what they found was that apparently the birds had been roosting in this tree for many years because they found several feet of dried bird droppings, dried swift dropping and full of all kinds of insects and things crawling around. So they, they tunneled through this bird excrement on to get over the top of it. And then inside they had a light, they went in at night and it took him several nights to do this kind of quietly without disturbing the birds too much. He finally got inside, was able to shine a lantern and estimated that there were 9,000 swifts inside this hollow tree. It was pretty amazing. You know, and then a few years later, he reported that the tree was hit by lightning and knocked down. Oh, here's what it looks like when they're staging. So here's a big flock over on NC State campus. One of the chimneys being used. This was just a shot with a, that a colleague took with a cell phone. But I think it, it's really cool how it shows them staging, getting ready. Um, and here is downtown at the NNO chimney. <clears throat> so it's a staging behavior that they do every fall. So again, when, now when they're not nesting, again, they, they become very social. They sleep in a communal roost and they will do this every night until they head out on their southbound migration to uh, South America, where I pointed out it's in the Western Amazon basin. And that's a really, it's a spectacular thing to, to witness. I mean, here's a couple of chimneys that have been used in downtown Raleigh over the years. Uh, unfortunately, you know, we're slowly losing these to, urban renewal projects, I, I think this one is either gone or about to go, but I was able to get up high enough in a, in a adjacent building and looking down, you can see that here's what, if you were a chimney swift flying overhead, this is the opening here that you would be dealing with. And here's an even uh, smaller one here. But during the industrial revolution, we made a lot of brick chimneys like this. And little did we know that these birds would, would really adapt to them so well. Uh, now we're starting to lose them. So it's sort of an ironic twist that as we do urban renewal projects and enhance our, our own habitat, we're, we're now reducing habitat for chimney swifts. John Burroughs was one of the early naturalists and writers here in the U.S. Um, he also wrote about watching chimney swifts. Um, a number of folks have over the years. Like I said, it's really uh, quite an event to witness. So during the month of September is when you can, you can see it all, all over the, the Eastern US. So he's saying that at a 55 foot chimney, he estimated uh, 10,000 swifts. So here's some shots I got again from up on a rooftop in downtown Raleigh using a couple of different uh, chimneys. <clears throat> it's interesting that for the longest time, oh, people did not know how the birds were entering into the chimney. Um, it turns out that uh, they will, they will uh, stop or slow down abruptly and pitch up, pitch their head up, and then they spread their tail and use their wings to, uh, almost as a reverse flight to slow themselves down. So they're, they're mostly entering uh, tail first. We used to think they were diving in head first, but they're not. And it would be hard for them to dive into a chimney and then pull up and stop so they stop just before they go in and uh, or they slow down just before they go in and this was this was they figured this out with some high speed photography and flash photography um but as you can see it was a, 
back in 1928 when they first got some footage that showed this. So here's what we know about their migration route. They come out of the U.S. and they seem to go along the, um, the coastline. They do not fly over water. Nobody's reported swifts going over the Gulf of Mexico. We know hummingbirds will fly over the Gulf, but all the swifts that have been reported, any flocks that seem to be chimney or voxes swift, which is a Western relative, they migrate. So they're coming over Belize here, maybe maybe in the Eastern Guatemala, but then over Honduras, so they're along the Caribbean coast through Nicaragua and down. And then it seems that when it gets down here, then they switch across. They do seem to cross the land here because then they, they're next seen in uh, Western Peru. So that's an interest, been an interesting observation that the Peruvian ornithologists figured out how to tell a chimney swift. And they report that these birds show up in uh, November along the coast. So here we are in Peru. So the birds cross over Panama and are coming down Ecuador, but people start seeing them in, in coastal Peru. So even in the town, for example, in Lima, and they're using buildings in Lima. But then they stop seeing them, say, a month later. And then that's when folks started noticing that they were seeing chimney swift like swifts over in Western Brazil, um, where there, there's one um, group of birds were found in the 1940s. Here in, in near Iquitas, there were Jesuit priests working in the area and working with some of the indigenous tribes. And one of the tribes went out and they built a fire at the base of the tree because that's how they would smoke out animals to eat. And one time a dozen birds fell out <clears throat> and some of those birds were wearing these little bracelets on their feet, which were the things we use to band or tag birds, call it ringing or tagging. And they reported it to the priest who sent it, who knew what to do and sent them back to the U.S. And so it's the only really confirmed or documented um, event of chimney swifts and it was right in this area but then other people are starting like i said they're starting to be able to identify them among the other kaitura swifts that occur here in the western amazon so we know if they go at least here but so they come down the coast and then apparently after spending a month or so here they take off and fly over the andes so they're flying over you know 14 15 000 foot andes mountains and then descending down into the western amazon and um, I guess before I sh move on, I just mentioned that uh, we now have tracking technologies to be able to uncover what the actual route is. It hasn't been done yet on Chimney Swift. It's been done on, on another Swift, the Black Swift, which breeds in the Rocky Mountains of the US. And uh, they were able to figure out that the bird um, was flying and wintering in a little spot down here in South Central Brazil. Um, what'll be interesting to find out with Chimney Swift is if in fact they're doing what looks to be like a figure eight migration pattern which is what we suspect that they're, they're doing that coming down as i said they switch they switch over to the west coast then they come over and then they come back and go up <clears throat> the same way they came back down they have been declining you know it's an uh, it's unfortunate that's another story of uh declining birds so this this is a, a color map sort of a heat map showing that the red is where the biggest declines have been occurring. Um, blue has actually been some increasing numbers, but you can see there's a lot of red throughout the species range. Um, that may be related to the fact that starting in 1995, new home construction uh, was no longer with brick or if the brick or if brick chimneys were built, uh, ceramic liners were included and the birds can't grip to that ceramic liner. So there, there's no more swift homes no more nesting homes being built like there were a lot of people cap their chimney not because of the birds so much but because of other problems so that's another loss and then of course all these other chimneys that are for different kinds of urban renewal we're just losing habitats so it's probably related to all those things and of course we don't know what's going on on the non-breeding ground because it's again it's difficult to study them when you you aren't really sure what you're what you're looking at so to help out with this, uh, years ago, Wake Audubon partnered with the Museum of Natural Sciences, and we raised money to uh, have a fancy tower built at the Prairie Regico Station, property we manage in West Raleigh. And it's, uh, it's a little more glamorous than it needed to be, but we wanted to make it a sort of a showpiece 
and uh, we haven't had birds roost in it yet uh, directly with indirectly by we've done audio lures. <laughs> so there are birds that roost in the National Guard chimneys, which are right across the street, literally just, just 100 and 200 meters away. There are birds that roost will be up to 2000 birds that go over to the National Guard property, but they fly from the west, which is to the left here. So we've gone out, John Connors and I and some of the young naturalists that we've had through Wake Audubon's Young Naturalist Program. We've had other volunteers come out and do playback, audio lures, some, some uh, vocalization uh, recordings I made downtown years ago. And we use that and we play it and darn the Swifts come right in. They're flying over to go to the National Guard and they will fly. Uh, they will fly over and stop. They will circle and come back. And we've had up to 100 birds actually fly in and spend the night in this chimney. But if we don't do the playback, they don't come back. They just go right over to the uh, chimneys at the National Guard. So we feel that there's something about a chimney swift. There's something about its biology and its behavior that once they get to a chimney, they're tied to they're tied to some, you know, the sense of place. And there's some maybe some social aspect to it that we don't understand because we don't really know who decides which chimney, like which which birds in a given flock decide to start using a chimney and then what we do know is that the the uh, the composition of the flock will change through the month of september because some birds leave and other birds come from up north and replace it so it's a sort of shifting dynamic but how do the birds find the other birds i mean they're circling around during the day and foraging so we presume that's how they locate their their cousins and then they follow those birds to the chimney but what kind of communication goes on we don't know and again we don't know why they uh, wouldn't want a new large chimney. Maybe there's something about the used chimney. There's some uh, fat, some features about that. Maybe that by, by virtue of having used it for a while, uh, there's some condition that the birds recognize as, as a place to go. So there's a lot of things about their biology that we really don't know. It's been interesting to see, but the birds do nest in this chimney each year. That's the uh, photos I showed earlier and there's actually a pair that with young right now over there and so we're still hoping for the the a flock to take up residence but that just goes to show you um the uh, things about the bird that we don't we don't know we are losing chimneys in urban areas all over and and it's we've had a lot of um <clears throat> we've we've been doing a lot of programs and John and I get a lot of emails from people around the country looking for information about both the Swift and also about building chimneys. And so it's pretty exciting to see people in Canada, in uh, the upper Midwest, New England, Mid-Atlantic, all these places have been contacting us and getting information and telling us that they're building different kinds of towers. Most of them are smaller than this because they don't have to be this big to attract a, a flock of birds. So again, um, we've been doing a lot through uh, Wake Audubon. And one of the things we uh, did a, a couple of years ago is work with the Transfer Food Hall, for example. They were doing uh, an urban renewal project and they were willing to retain an old chimney that some chimney Swiss had been using. So that's pretty exciting where we can work with developers doing projects to, uh, to try to retain an existing chimney where possible because it's always better than building a new one. And again, John and I have been working with folks, as I said, around the country and even in Canada to get them information and uh, just talk about their our failures and successes with doing chimney swift conservation. Um, if you can get out this fall, <clears throat> find a local place. You can check with a local bird club or a nearest Audubon chapter to find out where an active roost site is. We usually host some viewings through, uh, through Wake Audubon. Uh, we haven't decided yet this year. I mean, the, it's been obviously such a weird two years with the pandemic and we're just still uh, getting our feet on the ground. Um, but in the past, we've had lots of people come out to watch the birds come in to some of the active roost chimneys that we've been monitoring in downtown Raleigh for the past 20 years. Some schools still host some flocks. So they're just different places around and, and all through the uh, coastal plain, Piedmont and North Carolina. Carolina, you can find, um, and, and some of the lower elevation mountain sites, you'll find flocks of chimney swifts done. I thought you might like to see 
what it looks like when they're flying around. This is just uh, one of the chimneys in downtown Raleigh. So you can see, it's hard to tell that they're pulling up and going in tail first, but if you slow it down, I have slowed down the video, you can actually see that most of them are in fact pulling up at the last second and going into the chimney tail first. And you'll notice that they don't all go in as they're flying over. It's as if they are trying to be a little bit secretive about it. And, and maybe they're you know, fooling a predator from, from locking in on. We do sometimes see a Cooper's hawk or a peregrine falcon downtown going after chimney swifts. They will get one every now and then. So we figure that the, uh, the, the large numbers that go in, but not all at the same time, and some fly past is sort of a um, anti-predator technique and this is just another another video i was able to get up top uh, john and i up there on top of one of the buildings and get really close to the chimney um it felt like being in the wizard of oz with the monkeys coming in at coming as um it was a really neat experience you get a little seasick you know watching up close like this but <laughs> i couldn't help but try it at different uh angles and different zooms and this is just a point and shoot camera but um but it worked out for you know for what we're trying to show so this uh this at this at the time i we estimated this flock to be about 3500 birds so sometimes it'll just be two or three hundred birds in a small chimney in a small flock it doesn't have to be a big chimney in a big flock it can be a smaller chimney in a small flock but it is what they do is they get ready for their uh, southbound migration a beautiful sunset so they tend to go in you know as you can see the sun is already set so they tend to go in after sunset uh like the first 20 minutes after the sun is set and there's still light in the sky this is across the street from the previous chimney this is over at the by the news and observer uh this is actually the professional building chimney alongside the news and observer in this case there's actually a fair amount of, of wind we probably had a 10 mile an hour wind so you can see the birds are just facing into the wind and then all they have to do in this case is drop in. So this is, um, this is a lot easier for a, a chimney swift to handle when there's a little bit of wind. Um, and as you can see, it's now starting to get a little bit dark. So they're getting, they're, they're almost all in. Um, and lastly, so we, um, we helped some students come from UNC Chapel Hill. They were doing 3D video a few years ago of these flocks in downtown Raleigh because they, they were funded by the Department of Defense. They were interested in understanding how, how is it that these thousands of birds are flying around like they are and not running into one another, not colliding. They're actually thinking about how they might make drone technology mimic a flock of chimney swifts. So, you know, it's always interesting that uh, we turn to nature for a lot of our questions and answers about how we how we humans do what we do. Um, we also participated in a little TV show for Nat Geo years ago, John and I did. And this is a little footage that they took from one of those downtown Raleigh chimneys. They dropped the camera inside and left it overnight. So if you've ever wondered what a chimney swift does during the night, um, they, don't, they don't do much of anything. They're not exactly sleeping. So they're sitting there preening and you know moving around, apparently chatting with one another, uh, bumping each other. At one point, one of the birds is like, hey, I, I want to be there. And it bumps the other one out of the way. But you can see that they do uh, perch right where the mortar of the brick and mortar is. So uh, when folks design their own chimneys, they if they're using brick, they will you know, create mortar lines. If you're using a wooden structure, people leave little you know, gaps in, in the wood, a, a place for the, that's where the bird will, will perch. But um, yeah, you know, I th we thought maybe they just have their heads tucked in and all be asleep, but actually just just hanging out. And uh, I don't think we need to watch all two minutes of that, but um, interesting little video. So with that, um, I am done. Happy to answer questions. Again, uh, we like to say that uh, they tied long ago the Chimney Swift tied their future to ours, but the story is not over. Um, there have been, as I said, there's a number of uh, challenges for chimney swifts. Their numbers are declining. We're, we're losing habitat by virtue of the 
urban renewal stuff. And um, so we're still, we still have a lot to do to keep Chimney Swift on the landscape. Um, and with that, I will be happy to answer any questions. And Chris, I will turn it over, turn it back over to you. All right. Thanks so much, John. I'm going to try to get myself back up on here. Excellent stuff. Uh, I've been fortunate to see this presentation a couple of times now, but it's always great to, to get that refresher on the Swifts. And I didn't realize that we were just now coming out of the nesting season. Um, anytime we've talked about chimney Swifts, it's always been about the big roosts in late summer and fall. So that was kind of interesting to learn for me that they use the chimneys communally as roosts, but then there will only be one nest per chimney. I'm like, where do all of the other chimney swifts go? Well, that's just it. Then they need all these other household chimneys. That's in the in the past, <clears throat> it would have been all these hollow trees. But as we say, they don't make big hollow trees anymore like they used to. Uh, we, we've taken most of those down or they've fallen down. So then they adopted household chimneys. And so there are a lot of houses built uh, obviously in the last hundred years in the U S and, you know, again, ironically between the industrial buildings going up and all the housing that went up with chimneys, we, we created a lot of habitat for chimney swift. So in a sense, we helped boost the numbers. So maybe it's only natural that they're now declining, but it, it also seems a, a bit of a shame. So, uh, so for now they're, they're finding all these, uh, older houses with older chimneys to nest in. So a question that we had from the chat was, what do the chimney swifts do if someone lights a fire in a chimney? I would, you know, they would either, if they stayed in the chimney very long, they would die surely of the smoke inhalation, which is what happened with the birds in uh, Northeast Peru that time that the, that indigenous tribe smoked out these birds that were sleeping in this large hollow tree they weren't expecting bird they were expecting some small mammal or, or large reptile that they could eat um, and they got these swifts but uh, other birds if it were say during if, if you lit a fire and it were still some daylight uh, or you know just a little bit of light in the sky the birds would would likely get out of the chimney they can fly fairly well even when it's dark they have pretty good vision even at night um, but they don't seem to do that very very often. So, um, I mean, it would be bad. I mean, the good news is that in most places, we don't build fires when a chimney in a chimney when it's occupied by a chimney swift. So the birds, um, they are not in most of our homes. You know, by September, they're going to these bigger chimneys for their roosting flocks. And most places around here, they don't fire up any kind of heating, a chimney heating, until later in October. And the birds are mostly gone by around October 10th. So we, we, we see a big exodus in late September and early October. By the end of the first week of October, there aren't many swifts around in general, at least in the Wake County or Central Piedmont of North Carolina region. And then it, within the next week, certainly by October 15th, they're, they're pretty much gone. And so most people aren't building fires till after that. So it just works out that there's not much overlap. I, it would be detrimental. I think it's happened once. We heard of an example once that there was just a really cold spell in, a, in an early enough in October that somebody like a church turned on their furnace and it, it did end up zapping a couple hundred birds. But I just heard that secondhand. All right. There you go, folks. Okay, let's see here. Uh, the next question that I see in the chat, uh, David has been talking about some places where he's seen chimney swifts, mentioned old commercial property in Cary, but also this is interesting, not like in a chimney, but drain holes on the side of the building. Also, Buckhorn Dam below Shear and Harris Plant, where there are a lot of swifts in a drainage way wall. It would be really interesting to, um, you know, document any of that with some video and that sort of thing, because 
as I said earlier, Audubon and some of the other early naturalists, they reported that the birds were going into things using a side entrance. And we, we all grew up thinking the bird had to come in from the top. And, you know, we, I didn't have access to some of that, that early literature till much later and then realized that birds will, will go in from the side and birds in the tropics also do that. So it's interesting that if you're seeing that now, today, you know, or this, you know, in this time of 2020, 2021, and it's a bird, some birds in, say, Wake County or nearby, that would be interesting to, you know, get some video or footage or, uh, or send me the, uh, the, the details or locations and I can try to get some folks out to take a look. Um, because my, uh, yeah, my email is on the museum website, but it's typical of uh, john.gerwin at naturalsciences.org. Um, you know, even just sending me the locations and the observation, we can try to get some folks to go take a look. Because I think that's interesting. That's the kind of stuff we like to see what an organism is doing to adapt. That may be an adapt a recent adaptation for the fact that you know, we're losing some of the other chimneys. So maybe here's a case where the bird is once again pivoting, as we say, and adapting to the situation. That's really cool. Really cool. Really cool. So uh, next question for you. Jerry wants to know if we could smoke up the chimney at Prairie Ridge if the birds seem to be attracted by smoky residue in chimneys. That, you know, we, we sort of talked about doing something like that or um it was is there some other feature of chimney swift sort of chicken and egg like if they've been there long enough and they're that you know all the excrement it builds up it just dries out it's mostly water i can't you know we can't imagine that there's much in the way of an, uh, an aroma but see there's things about birds biology we still don't know you know it's only been fairly recent we realized they can see in the uv spectrum we always say birds can't smell but then some recent studies show that there are some songbirds that have some old fat, some decent olfactory sense. So like apparently it's catbird might be one of them. And so things that we don't know and so, or maybe there's something in the UV spectrum that we don't understand. So that is something that, yeah, we kind of, we're, we're talking about some different ideas. One other thing we noticed is that when we first designed the chimney, we went downtown and measured one of the chimneys, one of those chimneys that uh, you saw in the photo, we measured the base of it. And this is just one of those things, you know, we didn't understand. We measured the base, we sort of, uh, and we calculated the brick width and all that sort of thing. And then we told the architect, okay, so we'll make it this size. And it turned out to be about a five foot opening. And then later when I got up on top of, when I got in that other building several floors above and looked down, you saw that there are the big uh, concrete lips on the chimney. And in fact, the opening of that one was not five feet. It's more like three and a half feet. We, we realized later it, it's a lot smaller. And in fact, we talked to our colleagues in Texas who have been doing a lot of work designing different chimneys and different openings. And they came to the same conclusion through their work. They said, you know, something less than four feet is actually more attractive to these flocks of birds and we don't know why that is so now i'm in the process of going back and <laughs> trying to get or i like just add a little wooden lip to to ours just to make the hole a little bit smaller and see if that doesn't also attract them but i still will say that if the, the birds are over at the national guard and they seem to be so tied to their sense of, of place and i know of just one other example where uh, somebody needed to take a chimney down and replace it with another one and uh, the birds did not adapt did not take up right away in other words replacing a chimney doesn't seem to be the best thing to do so we've also joked about going over to the national guard property and just capping their chimney we wouldn't do that that would that would be mean but you know we wonder would the birds then go over to to our chimney or, or what would they do it would be an interesting a harsh experiment but an interesting one they, 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 um, that's just an aspect of their behavior. We don't know, but maybe, yeah, maybe having, maybe building a couple of little fires in, in our chimney would be a, a reasonable thing to try. <laughs> <laughs> and just take them all from the guard. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's see. You talked a lot about 
capped chimneys and the reasons that people would cap them. Uh, there's a question from Twitter. Is there a way to discourage a crow from my chimney that is not capped because of roosting swifts? Um, so the crow is attracted to the birds or just to the chimney? I guess I'm not sure of the, the question, but, but. Or I guess any other uncapped... wildlife. Yeah, that's the problem. So. Um, it depends on what the bird is actually, you know, what it's doing and where it's perching. And so what some folks have done is add things that will, that, that will say brighten. You can put up some of those twirly things, for example, or hang the uh, floor, uh, iridescent yard art, you know, waving flags and banners and things like that. I mean, it's a little garish on your house, but... Sometimes it's enough to you only have to do it for a week or two and the and the bird goes somewhere else. If the bird is perching somewhere you don't want, some people have been able to put up uh, take wire, for example, wire and and take broken ends of the wire and stick it straight up. So you're making this pad of of pokey wire sticking up and the bird's not gonna be able to perch. You have to put that on the surface where the bird is. Now if a bird is just gonna move to some surface nearby then it could take a lot of that to discourage the bird. Uh, but that's how they get pigeons to stop from perching on certain bridges and other places. They build these long, uh, essentially, strips of wire with their the loose ends sticking up and apply those to surfaces to keep the pigeons from perching. That, can, you know, that would work on anything, whether it's a crow or a raccoon or possum up there. Um, so, I, I mean, if the bird is attracted, if the crow is attracted to some of the, the birds in there, that is a problem. And we've actually seen that at uh, Prairie Ridge at the chimney. We've seen birds perching on top of the chimney, and we think they might actually drop down to get an egg or a nestling. I think I heard a report a couple of years ago of that happening. The crows are really ingenious that way. And so in that case... Yeah, it would take some serious, like maybe loud noise kind of uh, device to to get to get the crow to sc literally scare the crow away. That's why they came up with the scarecrow objects. But uh, some people have used devices that make a sound, you know, every thirty minutes. And some birds, like a crow, will uh, get used to the sound and ignore it. Other birds are dissuaded and, and leave the area. Uh, it, that is a that is a tough one. So if it's a, if the birds are nesting in the chimney, uh, one option too is to cap it for one cycle, and then uncap it the next cycle. But then that might that'll cause the crow to leave. But that's also tough. Then you don't you presume they'll come back, but you never really know. Um. Excellent, excellent stuff. Thanks. Uh, I think I'll have the last question because I'm curious with chimneys coming down like you mentioned urban renewal projects and people capping chimneys uh, but i think i've read and heard that forest particularly across the eastern u.s is actually increasing we're getting more areas with trees on them are we going to have to go back to calling them tree swifts well it will probably be a long time uh, these trees some of the, some of those trees that these birds were using were probably or, well, we're over 100 years old. Um, if you think about the life cycle of some of these hardwood trees that we're talking about, the sycamore, and it was some would have been um, cypress, tupelos. Well, I've seen the birds. I've seen birds go into a big uh, tupelo tree down in the coastal plain, of South Carolina. But that tree, we we there were four of us who could crawl inside the base of that tree and open our oh, arms wow. it was huge so we're talking about really big trees that are and the only way you get a really big tree like that is to be really old and then the tree has to begin uh, dying you know they have at, at a certain stage they start to die on the inside where they hollow out or they get a disease but that doesn't happen until they're pretty old so yes it's great to see the forest increasing but it'll be a long time before the trees are big enough and and start to show decay and and then hollowed out for the 
to, for the chimney swifts to go back to those. But I, but I, I think they would. I think they absolutely would go back to the trees if, if we start producing some big old hollow trees again. Um, there'll be a, there'll be a variety of animals. There's a lot of animals that will use a hollow tree, so it's not just those swifts. So, um, I'm sure there's a little competition too. So we need a lot of them. So I, I'm, I, I mean, I think that's a. I mean, it's a hopeful thing that, that will happen down the line, but it'll be way down the line. So that's why we still have kind of some work to do now just to bridge that gap. Yeah, absolutely. Well, John, thanks for uh, chatting with us about Chimney Swifts today on the Lunchtime Discovery Series. And uh, I'm sure we'll have you back on the program again pretty soon. Thanks for having me. All right, everybody. Uh, Remember, visit eenorthcarolina.org for the Office of Environmental Education's website. That's where you can see information about more events coming up. You can also get that information at the museum's website, naturalsciences.org. And of course, I always encourage you to follow everybody on social media. So the museum, we're at Natural Sciences on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. That's easy to remember. And you can follow the Office of Environmental Education and get updates about this program, other programs, and cool opportunities in environmental education all across the state of North Carolina. They're at North Carolina EE. So from the folks in the Environmental Ed Office and us at the Museum of Natural Sciences, have a great rest of your week, everybody. Take care, stay safe, continue to keep your community safe, and uh, we'll see you again next time. Bye, everybody. <laughs>